Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Chapter 4 on Cash and Internal Controls. Much in this chapter that's new, but I think you'll find it interesting and a bit exciting. Let's take a look. All right, we start out with internal controls. What are internal controls? Well, there are several reasons as for financial statements being misstated. There's accidental errors in reporting transactions or even in applying accounting rules, but there's intentional fraud when a person tries to deceive another company or person for personal gain or damage to that person. In occupational fraud, or using your occupation for personal enrichment through uh, basically stealing from the employer. Uh, three, the, 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 we talk about the fraud triangle, and here there are three parts of that fraud triangle. Opportunity, motivation, and rationalization. So we know that if you have an opportunity to allow fraud, it might occur. Uh, someone feels motivated to commit fraud, such as they need money, uh, then that's another part of the fraud triangle. And then how you rationalize or justify that deceptive act by committing the fraud. All right, so... Internal controls, then, are an attempt to eliminate the opportunity element of that fraud. Internal controls represent plans to safeguard the company's assets and improve the accuracy and reliability of the accounting information. The second bullet point is not always appreciated when you're first starting out in this course. So here, um, we're going to discuss the impact of accounting scandals and the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley Act. When I first started in accounting, um, my brother is a lawyer, and they have to have ethics training um, back when he got his law degree. Um, I used to kid him because we accountants didn't need ethics training because we we naturally knew ethical behavior and didn't need the training while lawyers didn't. A little joke between my brother and me. Um, however, in the early 2000s, that landscape changed dramatically. We had several scandals, and it prompted Congress to pass the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, sometimes called SOX, S-O-X. Uh, managers are entrusted with the resources of both the company's lenders and own owners, and we as managers act as our stewards and caretakers of those assets, but sometimes that responsibility has been shirked. Now, I know something about Sarbanes-Oxley as I was the SOX coordinator in my last position among them as a collateral duty. The two big ones um, that happened in the early 2000s was Enron and WorldCom. Both were um, audited by a big four auditing house, um, Arthur Anderson, and Arthur Anderson what then was the big five. Arthur Anderson, because of the problems that that meant for the people that had invested in those companies, um, they basically wrote their company off worldwide. Massive. Uh, Arthur Anderson. And that was not lost on the remaining four big four audit firms. Uh, major, major problems. We 
In Enron's case, which is the most publicized, they avoided reporting billions with a B in debt and losses. WorldCom misclassified expenditures to overstate assets and profitability. Uh, this, of course, uh, was part of why the stock value was overstated as well. So in 2002, we passed Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And part of that was the pub, uh, uh, it's known as the Public Company Accounting Reform and Investor Protection Act of 2002, long-winded title. Uh, it's extremely expensive and a ton of work. For example, we had to do over a hundred internal audits per quarter um, to verify that our internal control procedures were sound. And then those, the results from those audits had to be, of course, reviewed by me and our accounting and, and our management staff, but also that had to be audited by our outside audit firm. Now again, Sarbanes-Oxley only applies to U.S.-based companies. They do not apply to the uh, other 200 plus countries in the world. So, it established guidelines generally related to internal control procedures, the example I just indicated, but also the way our, our relationship with our outside auditors is conducted. In, in the old days, it was not unusual for us to go out on, for a, a golf outing and have dinner with our outside auditors and just have an enjoyable day. Uh, all that went away after Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, many, many changes I won't go through here specifically. But the major provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley uh, was Section 404, and there it requires the company to document and assess the effectiveness of all the internal control procedures and processes. And that's my example was supposed to illustrate that. And then the company auditors then express an opinion on whether the management's assessment of those that that effectiveness is fairly stated. Um, you have to be a fairly major company to have to do that, but it's but it's our pu public uh, publicly traded companies uh, corporations that are required to do this. And there is an oversight board as well, which I sometimes forget to mention, and it's called the public account the public company accounting oversight board. And that board has the authority to establish the standards dealing with audit, auditing, quality control, ethics, independence, and basically all the other activities related to preparing the audited financial reports. And they are appointed by the Securities and Exchange Commission, a government, a government organization. Okay. Key point, counting scandals in the early 2000s is what prompted SOX, as I mentioned. Uh, we have, and I, and I think I've basically gone through that, the relationship of the auditor-client and additional internal controls. Okay. Okay. Which of the following statements is not true of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act? And if you answer, Alpha, all companies in the U.S. fall under the, its provisions, all companies do not. Only publicly traded companies do. And those are the ones that have to file uh, financial statements with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Okay. 
Here we're going to identify the components, responsibilities, and limitations of internal control. In this diagram here, we're showing the methods of how we collect relevant information and communications in a timely manner. And we have monitoring and control activities and risk assessment in a control environment. And that's that little pyramid pretty much identifies uh, those activities. So here we have legal entertainments uh, notes to the financial statement here where they're indicating that the internal control definition is those that includes policies and procedures and all the things that make up internal controls. Uh, we, we use that to make sure that our financial statements are in conformance with the generally accepted accounting principles and that it provides reasonable assurance that unauthorized acquisition, use, or disposition of the company's assets could have a material effect on the financial statements. Okay, movie theater example, components of internal control. Here, our overall attitudes and actions of management greatly affect the control environment, and that is so true. Management sets the tone. If you have management that likes to take uh, liberties, let's call them, with the way they conduct themselves and the way they conduct business, that's going to ripple down to the subordinate management, which will ripple down to the employees. Management needs to set the right tone and attitude. Um, risk assessment is something that we carefully consider when we establish internal and external risk factors. And then our control activities provide a variety of policies and procedures that we use to protect the company's assets and then we monitor those internal controls to make sure that what we think is happening is in fact happening. And then lastly, our in information and communication depend on the reliability of the accounting system itself. So I think you can see that this is a fairly massive undertaking to establish all those policies and procedures and have a system that's well defined as far as internal controls. Uh, we have preventative controls and those are uh, a segregation or separation of duty. If we have tasks that we assign to several people instead of one person, uh, it it allows for us to uh, have a better system of internal control, like uh, accounting for an asset and separating that from the control of that asset. Physical controls, uh, our accounting records, must be kept safe and accessible, and only our accounting people should be able to get into our accounting records. They should be locked up or even password protected on computers and that kind of thing. And then we have proper authorization when so that fraud is prevented because unauthorized people are not allowed to use the company's resources. We have employee management. The company should provide appropriate guidance on how to do their jobs. And then e-commerce control. It's always good to make sure that our employees know exactly what they are responsible for. And that's a strong piece of internal control. So that sounds like a good place for us to stop for this video. And when we return, we will continue with video number two. Bye for now.